रामाय राम भद्राय रामचंद्राय वेद से रघुनाथाय नाथाय सीताय पति ए नम सुंदरकांड चैप्टर नंबर थर्टी एट काका सुरा The words of Lady Sita gladdened the heart of Hanuman of very keen intellect and he hastened to reply Mother you speak in entire consonance to the nature of women folk and the humility and lordliness of heart of noble wives It is not possible as you say for a woman like you to cross this waste of water over 100 leagues in extent and that on my shoulders again you will not touch any other man but my lord Rama I tell you once more that it befits you the beloved wife of that great soul I know of no other person who would speak so trust me to place before my master everything that I see and hear in this home of your exile I spoke a little while ago with a pure heart and out of no other ulterior motive I desired to do what would please my lord the most I took the liberty of free talk with my queen and there are several reasons behind it Verily it is no easy task to cross this vast sea it is no holiday talk to cross the sea and find a way into this lanka so closely guarded night and day by terrible rakshasas yet it is possible for me to perform what i promised and others will not find it so light hence my seemingly careless speech my love and devotion towards raghava my sincere and humble reverence to yourself impels me most powerfully to take you to his side this very moment else i would never have dreamt of speaking so harshly as it would seem should you feel disinclined to go with me where my lord abides i pray you acquaint me with such facts of your past that might convince raghava that i did indeed speak with you Then did Mother Sita set about to narrate certain incidents that happened to her when she was alone in the forest with her beloved husband. The past rushed upon her with overwhelming force and brought into sharp contrast her present life of miserable exile. Her fast falling tears made her speak low and indistinct. Anjaneya Once in the past we happened to stay for a while at the holy spot hard by the stream Mandakini it was to the northeast of mount chitrakuta and the favorite resort of siddhas and hermits for it was ever fresh in fruits roots and water i will tell you of an incident that happened to us there you may take this to my beloved as a sign of recognition One day I happened to disport myself over much with fruits in the groves and the glades teeming with fruits and flowers of infinite variety and then I rested for a while on your lap then a crow roamed for meat came up to where we were and pecked at my breast I hit it with a pebble and drove it off but it tasted blood and the wicked creature came back again and again and tortured me however hard I tried to drive it off it hovered round and never got away i got up in wild excitement to free myself from the bother of the crow my upper garment slipped away and i clutched at it sharp with my girdle and rushed at the bird angrily i struck at it again and again and chased it about but as often it pecked at me and not let go then you made fun of my weakness at not being able to drive away a foolish bird i was overwhelmed with shame and wrath beyond words but you calmed me by many a soothing word and act then quite tired i rested my head again on your lap My tears fell fast at the thought of my inability to defend myself against a puny crow that worried me. Well, I consoled myself as best as I could. I hope you will remember the scene full well. I slept long and soundly for I was very tired and he in turn lay upon my lap out of sheer weariness. Then the wicked crow came up again and even as I got up from the lap of Raghava rushed at me plunged its iron beak between my breasts it hit me again and tore and bit off pieces of flesh with deliberate cruelty hot blood flowed fast from the gaping wound and chanced to break the slumbers of ragunatha his might was so terrible that it could consume to nothing his most invincible foes even while he was sleeping profoundly 
At last, all powerless to defend myself against an insignificant bird, I roused him. Then did the hero behold in all its enormity what the crow had dared to do, the sharp beak dripping hot blood and the lacerated breast of mine quivering in agony. His breath came hard and fast and furious like the serpent of doom as he cried, Life of my life, who is it that has dared to tear at your breasts in this horrible manner? Who would play lightly with a five-headed serpent hissing for the offender? His eyes fell upon the crow with its cruel beak and claws dripping with my blood. It was, as we came to know, Jayanta, the son of Indra. It became aware that the wrath of Raghava was aroused and would be shot at him. Oh, I'm lost, cried he, and before the eye had time to wink, it disappeared in the earth. Raghavira thought for a while and came to know who the crow was and what he was there for. Fire flashed from his eyes at the cruel insult put upon his trusting wife, so frightfully mangled. He decided to punish it most cruelly. His terrible bow and arrows were not there to hand. It mattered not. He drew out a blade of straw from the seat upon which he reclined. He invested it with the might of the dread weapon of Brahma and sent it after the senseless crow. The missile blazed like the fire of doom and chased the bird across the skies. Then the crow ran, flew, dodged, vanished, used all his arts and wiles to escape the fatal dart. It was all in vain. It cried out in mad appeal to all and several to protect it from death and roamed all over the world. Alas, it found no response for who would stand between it and the row of Rama. Then it bethought itself of its mighty father, the lord of the celestials, and rushed to him with piteous cries. Indra beheld its cruel asura form and wild misery in its eyes. He heard it out and cast his eyes on the terrible weapon of Brahma that sought his life. When my Lord Rama has decided to send death after a creature, I must be tired of life to seek to interfere. Again, this punishment is in line with the enormity of the crime. Further, would I ever forget that I owe my life, my honor, my happiness and my kingdom to the mother of mercy at a time when I was deprived at one stroke of my wife, kingdom, splendor and fame and had to hide my wretched head from all beings? And would I ever entertain a thought of kinship or pity for the wretch who has dared to so cruelly insult the great mother? I am his father, but the father of all has washed his hands of him, and I see no reason why I should act otherwise. Again, shall I forget that Sri Rama is my brother? To offend him is to offend myself. Again, he has come down among men to lay low the dread Ravana, at whose hands I and the other gods suffer insult, disgrace, and misery past endurance. This creature has set itself against my Lord, and hence he is as good as one who seeks to bring us trouble and sorrow. If a member of a clan stands between it and its well-being, it is but just and proper that he should be sacrificed for the common good. And so he deliberately drove out Jayanta with curses. Then did the miserable crow seek the mother that bore it for protection from the messenger of death. She would have a soft heart for him and a blind eye to his faults. But she cried to him in horrified accents, You are not my son, but some dreadful monster of wickedness. The mother of all has deliberately chosen to come down among us and wipe away our tears and bring peace to our hearts and homes. She has placed her fetters on herself and is going through sorrow, misery, misfortune, privations and troubles unspeakable. And this miserable wretch who has cruelly offended my mother has no mother to claim him as her son. And she too drove it away with blows and curses. Then the crow appealed for protection to its brother gods. Well, well, they said, 
we owe our eternal youth and joy and power and wisdom to Lord Mahavishnu who gave us the waters of immortality to drink at a time when the Asuras would have taken it away from us by force. His mighty arm led us on to victory and ruled over the world of the Shining Ones. Our patron saint, the god of our hearts and homes, should his eyes ever blaze with wrath at us, where are we then? And they too would have nothing to do with the god-forsaken crow. Then Jayanta sought refuge with birds like itself. But they were not to be so easily deluded by its persuasive appeals for mercy. Our Lord and Master Garuda thinks himself supremely blessed at being chosen to bear Sri Rama, the Lord of the Worlds. And why did this wretch dare to come to us who has roused the slumbering fires of wrath of Raghavira? And they tore it and drove it out from them. Then it fell at the feet of the Maharishis. They were kind-hearted, they were holy. They had the right and the privilege to speak to the Lord on his behalf. But they saw into the past, the present, and the future. We are in trouble and danger if we harbor this crow. Rama himself will deliver it from misery. Again, this crow is the most despised of the birds. It is crime for us even to look at him. For the Lady Sita, the Great Mother, stands between the whole creation and the Lord as the one who intercedes for us and secures for us life and light eternal. And to him who has dared to lay his foul touch upon her, peace, happiness and life are forever close. And they turned away from it with disgust. Then Jayanta roamed again and again through the earth, the middle world and the realm of the gods, the holy rishis on earth, the birds in the heavens and the gods in the world of light, the very parents that gave him birth all put him away. But he would not die. He begged for protection and refuge of each and every one that he came across in mad despair. He sought for refuge in each and every hiding place that he could get at, and he was driven away with taunts, blows, and curses. Then he sought the feet of Raghavira, the lord of the worlds. If it so chanced that the great mother of mercy herself should accuse a person before the Lord, he would proudly reply, My beloved people can never be guilty of any offense, and even if they might be charged with it, it would amount to no serious crime with me. And he would cast his shield of protection over his chosen ones. And even him did Jayanta appeal to for mercy and protection from a horrible fate. Further, Sri Rama came of the line of kings of which Kakutsta was a shining ornament. And he stood between Indra and the powerful Asuras and brought defeat and disgrace upon the enemies of the gods. Now Sri Rama's heart grew soft at the son of that self-same Indra. Death was the lightest penalty for that unspeakable crime that he had perpetrated. But the poor wretch had by that time suffered enough in his mad search through the worlds. He had lost all hope in others. He had thrown himself at the feet of him who sent death after him. Moreover, to protect the weak and the suffering, to wipe away the tears of the miserable, is a life work for Raghunanda. And so he looked at the crow with pity and affection as it was lying at his feet. All creation looks up to him and to no other for peace and plenty, happiness and protection. The crow has had enough of suffering as it roamed through the worlds and found all its efforts barren. It had come back to the giver of all good. It had put away the unreal and elected the real, the eternal. So its misery and agony and tears touched Rama's heart. But the weapon of Brahma must have an object. Jayanta, I leave you off lightly and give you back your lost life if you promise to sacrifice your right eye to the dread messenger of death that has you in its grip. Jayanta was only too glad to escape on those conditions and lost his right eye for life and what it meant was yet left to him. Then he bowed in reverence to his protector Raghavira and Dashratha that gave to the world his great soul son and took his way back to his world on high, sadder but wiser. Lord of the worlds, 
Did you not go out of your way to send a Brahmastra after a puny crow? I am very curious to know what impels you to put up with this puny Rakshasa who stole me from you, blackened your face and subjects me to unheard of insults and cruelties. Of boundless spirit and energy, am I beneath your notice and beyond the shadow of your mercy? Your name is synonymous with utter impossibility to see any creature in sorrow or suffering. And it would be more consonant with your frame to put your principle into practice and wipe away the blinding tears of myself who have no refuge but in you. Else you will be denied all claim to the proud title of the ideal man and king. Keep hold of it at any cost. I have as my protector and lord the ruler of the worlds, and yet I am the most helpless creature in existence. One day I chanced to ask you when we were alone, just let me know the rule of life that lies next to your heart. What is your ideal of duty? This reminds me of the traveler who is asked to pay his fare after he gets into the ferry boat. And you answered promptly, The noblest rule of life is not to see a fellow being in misery and grief. That lies next to my heart. Nay, it is ingrained in the very core of my being. And this I had from your own lips. No messenger or friend brought a report of it to me. But the rule of life you have set for yourself is honored more in the breach than in the observance. Now, Anjaneya, fail not to put it to my lord as strongly as you can. Tell him besides, no one knows as well as I do that you are adorned with infinite excellences, valor, spirit and strength. You are like unto the vast deep in fortitude. You stand aloft deep rooted like unto the golden Mount Meru. Your sway extends over the sea-girt earth, even as Indra holds sway over the kingdom of the celestials. No one has ever heard of my Raghavira go back on his word. No one has ever sounded the depths of his valor and strength. Then, how is it that he holds back his unerring shafts from the hearts of these wicked night rangers? The Nagas, Gandharvas, Asuras and the Devas are but light chaff before the on-rushing might of the arrows of Rama, the messengers of death. I wonder his keen shafts have not yet pierced the hearts of these workers of evil, these black-hearted Rakshasas, if, as I believe fondly, that I lie next to my Rama's heart and that he burns with a consuming desire to free me from this vile bondage. Nay, it is quite enough if he passes in order to his brother Lakshmana, for is he not the prince of heroes, the mightiest of the mighty, the holy terror of his foes? He can very easily get permission from Rama to throw his shield over me. The embattled hosts of the heaven world dare not stand before the brothers whose speed and splendor put to shame the lords of fire and air if they are together. Then why do they not waste a thought upon my poor self? Is it that their might has left them and they are powerless to exterminate my tormentors and free me from this durance vile? It is now months since I was torn apart from his arms and yet no sign or shadow of any such enterprise on his part. If he but has the slightest idea of the taunts, the insults and the misery I go through every moment, they would think their very lives well sacrificed to save me from Ravana, and am I not worth it? So I am driven to the conclusion that either they or I must be guilty. The world counts them as entirely capable of doing what I pray for. Then the whole blame falls upon me and no doubt of it. Well, I do not pretend to be all wise. I may have all unknown to me, stay in my soul with sin or crime or impropriety, and it dogs my step until I pay it to the uttermost. A cause cannot fail to produce an effect. Ah, now that I remember it, 
He refused to take me with him to the woods, and I replied most impudently, Alas, my father was outrageously deceived into taking you for a man. He knew not that you were but a faint-hearted woman, cleverly disguised as a man. That one word is more than enough to shut the gates of his mercy upon me. That crime cannot be washed away by any amount of penance or penance during the endless cycles of time. Thus did Lady Sita pour her heart out in wild grief, her fast falling tears choking out the words even as they arose. Anjaneer was shaken to his depths at this and cried out, Mother of the universe! You know not that my Lord Rama is hopelessly sunk in an ocean of grief. Bereft of you, his heart takes no delight in the pleasures of life. And Lakshmana but reflects his misery a thousandfold. I swear it on truth, right and virtue. I have gone through all this trouble, danger and difficulty to be able to speak to you and I see no reason why you should have anything to do with sorrow or tears hereafter. This moment has seen the last of your miseries. The mighty brothers, the lords of all creation are burning with eager desire to have a sight of you and will reduce this proud Lanka to a heap of ashes. They will slay out of hand this wicked Ravana, his kith and kin, and lead you back to Ayodhya. So give me the message I should take back to Raghava, Lakshmana, the puissant Sugriva, and his myriads of monkey hosts. And to him replied Sita with unsteady accents, Marathi, Women desire children to secure their happiness here and peace hereafter, and to protect them from want and danger. The Lady Kaushalya did not do so. The noblest of women, she observed countless fasts, penances, vows and privations to beget a son that should cast a shadow over the countless worlds and make them live in peace and happiness. And she had her wish. Now is it likely that her prayers will go barren? And am I not one of the countless millions he has come down to save from evil and sorrow? In fact, it is utterly improper of me to pray for his protection, but the burden of it lies more upon him than upon myself. Delay has made me overstep the bounds of my duty. I but urge him on with no other motive. It is quite enough for me if he has the power to destroy my grief, then I am in every way guaranteed of my heart's wishes. I but have to pray that his right arm and heart should ever wax in power and mercy in the case of those that seek refuge with him. So tell my beloved Lord Raghuvira that I only wanted to assure myself of his well-being. Tell him that I laid my head at his feet. For if I had anything to pray of him, like the commonality, this humble reverence of mine is quite enough to secure me my object. Garlands, gems, luxuries that the heart may desire to the utmost, loving wives and everything that this broad earth could give a man, Lakshmana has without a pang, without a regret, put away behind him. He sought the leave of his parents in all humility to follow his brother out of the overwhelming love and devotion to him. He lives but to wait upon his brother and serve him every way in the wild forests and watch over him. Of mighty shoulders like unto the monarch of the forest and long powerful arms, noble and magnanimous by nature, endowed with a charming presence, he looks upon me as the mother that bore him and upon Rama as the father of whose loins he came. Ever reverent and worshipful of his elders, he was marked out for the unique honor and privilege of serving Rama at all times, in all places, and in all ways. There is nothing to which he cannot turn his hand as a master craftsman. A man of few words, he takes his place along with my father-in-law, the mighty king Dashrata, whose favorite son he was. No less is he in my affection, for he is the noblest of men, the embodiment of truth. 
meant by nature and inclination to be the brother of Rama, he never failed to carry out the orders of his master. Rama forgets the poignant sorrow caused by the death of his father in that Lakshmana is ever before him to gladden his heart. Pure of thought, word and deed, soft of heart, dear to Raghava as a very apple of his eye, I desire you to tell him that I would know that he fares well and that I would be pleased if he bestows a thought upon me and my sufferings. I am sure that he is all unaware of my being spirited away by this Ravana, else my miseries would have been over a long time ago. Anjaneya, I look to you and to no other to see that my Raghava wipes away my tears and brings comfort to my heart. Best and bravest of the monkey world, I trust you and no other to do this for me. It is through your skill and might that Raghava should take the necessary steps to rescue me from this dreadful island prison. I pray, please take my message to Rama, the prince of heroes, I'm a lord as well, and the son of King Dashratha. A short month lies between me and a cruel death. This is true, you have my word for it. In the far past, Indra, the lord of celestials, foully put to death the Asura Vritra, who was a holy Brahmana. The sin of it drove him from heaven, from his kingdom, from his wealth and affluence, and pursued him through the woods. Poor and miserable, he found favor with the lord Vishnu, who conducted a horse sacrifice for him, in which the other lords helped. His sin fell away from him like a dark cloak, and he was once more bright and happy. Even so, the sinful wretch of Ravana put a glamour over me, and I am here in vile bondage. Whom have I to call upon to free me from this, except your merciful self? Marathi, repeat this message of mine to him every now and then, until he sets about to effect my deliverance. And she took from a fold of her garments a lovely ornament that shone of yore amidst her dark tresses and gave it to Maruti as a sign of recognition. He received it in humble reverence and tried to fit it on his finger. But he forgot that he had changed his vast proportions for a very subtle form and it failed to fit in. Then Hanuman went round her in reverent adoration and stood by with joined hands. His body was in Lanka, dilated with boundless joy and having come upon the Lady Janaki. But his heart was at the feet of his master at Kishkindha, like unto a hill shaken a while ago by a tornado. Anjaneya, who was about to quit his hold upon life in despair at having failed in his quest, was transported with joy at having met her in the Ashoka Grove. He took charge of the jewel handed to him and set about to carry the welcome news to Lord Raghava. Mangalam Koshlendraya Mahaniya Gunavdiye Chakravarti Dhanurjaya Sarvabhomaya Mangalam.